welcome to a new episode of the Pakistan Experience. We've been meaning to discuss the South Asia paradigm and what the Taliban rule means for all of South Asia. We couldn't have asked for a better guest. Michael Kugelman is here with us today. He's the Deputy Director of the Asia Program in DC and the South Asia Senior Associate at the Wilson Center. How are you doing, Michael? Very well, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, I do want to talk about South Asia, but since uh, we're just recording this two days after the 20th anniversary of 9-11, I'll be remiss not to ask you about that. And I just finished watching 9-11, the Turning Point documentary on Netflix, which I think is excellent, highly recommended to everybody. So my, I have a very specific question. In terms of what Barbara Lee said after 9-11, uh, and any loss of life is highly condemnable and our hearts go out to all the victims, all the first responders. But do you think America really lost a part of itself in terms of what it did after 9-11 and losing all the human rights values that it espouses. So in terms of the legacy of Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo Bay and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, do you feel America lost a lot more than just the lives lost on 9-11? Yeah, it's a great question. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, I think that certainly you know, the last 20 years have brought a number of tactical victories for the U.S. in terms of uh, specifically eliminating a number of huge terrorists like bin Laden. But I do think that those tactical victories have come at a, at a strategic cost. Um, certainly you look at what has happened, what the policies, the war on terror policies of the United States have wrought over the last 20 years. It includes many people who have been killed. And you know, looking at Afghanistan, which of course was really the, um, the, the main results of the war on terror, particularly in its early days. And uh, you know, US forces enter that country and uh, they achieve their initial goals in Afghanistan very early on in terms of eliminating the, uh, the sanctuaries used by Al Qaeda and then removing their Taliban hosts from power. And then after that, there was this really long period of mission creep where the US was never really able to figure out or articulate a clear reason why it was still fighting. And yet the war continued, even when the Taliban early on had indicated a desire for negotiations with the U.S. And you had about, I think, according to the Watson Institutes um, at Brown University, about 114,000 Afghans, both security forces and civilians, have died over the last 20 years. Um, obviously, most of those deaths came at the hands of the Taliban, but you know, the U.S. could have easily, um, I think, wrapped up that war much earlier. Meaning, you wouldn't have all, you wouldn't have had all those deaths. And certainly, from a from a domestic standpoint here in the U.S., the policies that uh, that came out, like the the Patriot Act and all of these surveillance policies that made life miserable for so many people of color, and particularly uh, you know Muslims, American Muslims, and the reputation that that had on the United States. Certainly, it was uh, it was it was quite damaging, I would say for sure. And I do think in the early days and early the early weeks after 9/11, there was a lot of unity around the world in support of the United States. Even bitter enemies of the U.S. were were flying American flags, but clearly it was what happened in the months and years that that followed. Um, and you know, you look at the balance sheet. Bottom line is: is the world safer from terrorism now than it was in 9/11? At 9/11, to some extent, perhaps, right? You know, I don't think anyone believes there's going to be a huge 9/11 type attack anytime soon. But you know, you have all of these terrorist groups that exist now that did not exist. Um, when the U.S. began the war on terror, like ISIS, for example. You have all of these powerful affiliates and satellites of al-Qaeda that didn't exist before 9-11. So yeah, short answer to your question is that, um, unfortunately, I think that uh, the, the, the actions and the policies that the U.S. pursued as part of its war on terror really um, damaged its reputation in a big way and, at the end of the day, killed a lot of people. And that's just really tragic. You're right, there was a global outpour of sympathy and everybody condemned it except people on the rooftops of New Jersey that you could see from Trump Tower, except those people. Um, right. So do you, you also argued for the fact that due to American presence in Afghanistan, America was safer. Do you still maintain that now that America has left, considering the fact that there are policy experts who are arguing for the fact that Afghanistan will once more become a sanctuary for global terrorists? And we already see reports of some movements of terrorists from even Syria moving to Afghanistan. Do you feel we will revert back to an era where Afghanistan provides a safe haven for terrorists around the world? Yeah, so I think that we need to distinguish when we talk about Afghanistan reverting to a terror safe haven, we have to really sort of uh, hone in on that term terrorism. I think that, yes, Afghanistan will become even more of a terrorist sanctuary than it already is in terms of 
groups that are able to stage attacks in Afghanistan and in the broader region. But I don't necessarily think that we're going to see Afghanistan revert to the type of terror sanctuary that it was uh, 20 years ago, where you had groups that had the capacity to, to plan and mount attacks far beyond Afghanistan and the region, such as in the U.S. homeland. And I think that those analysts that had advocated for U.S. forces to stay in Afghanistan exaggerate this notion of you know, how Afghanistan is going to become just like it was in 2001 and Al-Qaeda is going to be able to, uh, to plan and carry out attacks on the United States. I don't think that's the case. I and mean, when you look at what's going on in Afghanistan, yes, we hear very frequently that you've got the more than a dozen different uh, UN-designated terrorist groups in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. That's true, but these are these are local, they're, mil they're regional groups like uh, you know, the Taliban and the, the Haqqani Network and uh, uh, these various Pakistani groups like the TTP and Lashkari Taiba and so on. These are not the types of groups that have the capacity to carry out large scale attacks far beyond Afghanistan and the region. You look at Al Qaeda and ISIS. These are the only two that have this, this capacity to carry out uh, externally focused attacks. Al Qaeda, it's a shadow of its former self. I agree, it's certainly not dead. And when you have every president uh, say that Al Qaeda has been defeated, that's wrong. Uh, its head has not been. But it doesn't have the strength that it used to. I mean, the Al Qaeda leadership. Uh, this, the, the sanctuaries have been degraded in a big way, and certainly Al Qaeda can depend on the support of some of these smaller groups uh, and you know less more regionally focused groups. And all of these groups in Afghanistan are aligned with Al Qaeda, so they could provide money, arms, uh, and so on. But there's no I don't have any reason to believe that Al Qaeda presently has the capacity to uh, carry out another 9-11. And so the theory from, from opponents of that view would be, oh, well, just give them time because the Taliban is in full control. U.S. forces aren't there. It's going to be difficult to carry out counterterrorism terror activities against al-Qaeda. Sure, sure. It may have, be, have the ability to reconstitute and gain some strength. But still, I think it would be pretty far off where we have to worry about this group in a position to carry out large-scale attacks beyond the region. Same with ISIS Khorasan. ISIS Khorasan is, is certainly resilient. It's been present in Afghanistan for quite some years and has done horrific things there, of course. But you know, ISIS Khorasan struggles to, uh, to, find, uh, uh, to find partners. Um, ISIS Khorasan is, is a rival of pretty much all of the groups in Afghanistan. And ISIS Central, of course, is, has fallen uh, in a big way. It's been put on defensive. So I don't think we should be complacent, but um, bottom line is that yes, uh, Afghanistan is a terrorist sanctuary, it will become even more of one, but I think for the most part, for the types of groups that are more dangerous within Afghanistan and the broader region, which of course is no solace for, for Pakistanis and Indians and Afghans and so on, but in terms of the threat to the US homeland, I wouldn't overstate it. I do agree. I think Central Asia, I might, if I may add Central Asia to that as well, they might face a threat and they are concerned with the US may be far flung. Uh, if I may just ask the follow up on that, the logistical restriction that you're talking about, is it just based on the fact that uh, how the situation is right now that they're logistically incapable of doing it? Or do you also have a suspicion it may not hold, but for now the US may have a tacit agreement with the Taliban to ensure that they do not export terrorism, at least to the U.S. or their allies in the West. Right. I mean, the Taliban has has never been a group that seeks to actively export terrorism uh, overseas in the sense that its own goals and interests are very parochial. They're very Afghanistan focused. Its idea is to, you know, build out this this emirate in Afghanistan. The Taliban, of course, has had ties to the types of groups that do export terrorism, like Al Qaeda uh, in particular. That's and that's that's sort of a contradiction, given the Taliban's focus on Afghanistan. Why would it want to have these links to these international groups? And there, there have been indications really since the mid to late 1990s that some leaders within the Taliban were increasingly uncomfortable about having these, this alliance with Al-Qaeda. Um, there were many uh, Taliban leaders in the late 90s that were getting uncomfortable with this growing confrontation between bin Laden and the United States. Of course, Mullah Omar was not one of those Taliban leaders that was uncomfortable with that alliance because he, of course, was the one that refused to give bin Laden up to the Americans, and then you know the rest is history. But to your question, um, it's it's obviously a very strange and, and surreal and, and sensitive issue. This notion of the U.S. hooking up with the Taliban uh, to uh, to go after their common ISIS rival uh, to me it seems sort of hard to believe, and even more hard to believe now, given that. 
you know, we know that this Taliban government is going to have a Haqqani uh, network leader um, in the role of interior minister, at least in an acting capacity, which means that if the U.S. really wants to partner with the Taliban on security and counterterrorism issues, they'll need to partner with the very guy that the U.S. regards as one of the most dangerous international terrorists, someone that has a, what is it, like a $5 billion, $5 million bounty on his head, uh, Sarah Eugene uh, Haqqani here. So, I think that you know maybe there could be some limited uh, attempts to sh share intelligence or that type of thing, but I don't think that we should assume that the U.S. is going to uh, want to actively work with the Taliban. And there's also the the risk that you have a lot of back and forth. Or really, you have a lot of disaffected um, Taliban. Uh, members that have gone to ISIS Khorasan. And I think that one of the big fears is that if the U.S. starts to actually partner closely with the Taliban and they start to do a lot of intelligence sharing and work closely, you know, the risk is that you'll have some of these Taliban that are cooperating with the U.S. jumping ship and going over to ISIS Khorasan and bringing all kinds of intelligence and information about the U.S. with them, which would be a, which would be a disaster. I think it would be a, a, a completely, the completely wrong thing to do for the US to look at the Taliban as a counterterrorism partner. So the argument that is made is not to dismiss the notion that the US might collude with the terrorists or would have no issues for geopolitical interest of colluding with a terrorist organization or somebody on the most wanted list. Uh, there's also an argument made that the US and Biden was clear about we, we weren't there for nation building. Uh, there was also a clear agreement that the Taliban will not attack US troops and US embassy. Uh, they essentially sold off the Afghan government and the Afghan military that they spent years making. They did not even include them as part of the discussions. So this argument that it is in the U.S. best geopolitical interest and broader geopolitical interest beyond Afghanistan for Afghanistan not to be completely stable because it keeps Russia and China on their toes. Yeah, I mean, there's always a lot of conspiracies um, about these uh, types of things. I would argue that, you know, as I said earlier, the U.S. has struggled to articulate a strategy for why it's continued to be in Afghanistan for so long. But I really think that counterterrorism has has been the main lens through which it's looked at uh, at the situation in, in Afghanistan. And you know, I think you know, Biden concluded that those counterterrorism goals were achieved. You could argue whether that's true or not. And then moving forward, the U.S. engagement with Afghanistan uh, or the policy in Afghanistan will largely revolve around figuring out how to develop a capacity to continue to monitor and surveil terrorists and also strike them through, through air power um, through this over the horizon notion without uh, boots on the ground. I really don't think that the great power rivalry is a big thing in the Afghanistan context. I don't really think that the, the U.S. Uh, government is going to really be all that concerned at the end of the day that China and Russia are going to be hypothetically in a position to step up their role in Afghanistan now. Um, you know, this, these rivalries play out everywhere and, and in much of Asia and beyond. But you know, I think that the U.S. has, has operated um, or how it's engaged with Russia and China in the Afghanistan context. This is one of the rare cases where the US has actually been willing to decouple its tensions with both Moscow and Beijing to partner with them in regional diplomacy focused on Afghanistan, right? I mean, you have this Troika Plus arrangement set up, which entails a grouping of the US, Pakistan, Russia, and China. There have been several meetings. So the US has engaged, perhaps not happily, happily but it has engaged with Russia and China and on Afghanistan. And they actually have generally the same interests. Um, you know, I think that the U.S., like China and Russia, want there to be more stability in Afghanistan. All three of them are willing to accept a Taliban government. Now, obviously, the, the U.S. would have preferred that it be a power-sharing arrangement, not the type of the one that you have now, but it's willing to accept the status quo in ways that other countries, such as India, are, are certainly not happy with. So, you know, I think that you know, you could argue that maybe it's, it's it's a strategic defeat for the U.S. in the sense that it's some of its top rivals will be in a position to step up their game. But I think that the U.S. looks elsewhere, particularly to the East, the Indo-Pacific, the East Asia region, where it's much more concerned about ceding space to China and, and Russia, so to speak. You know, South and Central Asia have never been places, or at least not in recent history, and they're not places where the U.S. has ever had any type of competition with China and Russia. China and Russia just have such a deeper footprint 
and have for such a long time in terms of diplomacy, infrastructure investments. The U.S. couldn't hold a candle to that before the withdrawal when it was still there in Afghanistan, and it certainly won't be able to with U.S. forces gone. And I think that's just something that the U.S. will be willing to to accept. If I may add on that, I do think Biden is straw manning a little when when he says we could not have stayed there forever. Uh, most analysts and experts argue that the exit was botched up and the solution was not to stay there forever. And maybe there is some truth to what Donald Rumsfeld said, said, said as well, which was worst case scenario, we just go back in 10 years and uh, it may not be counter terrorism, may not be the main lens. It may be military industrial complex, but all that remains to be seen in the next decade or so. But in terms of China's role, uh, there are a lot of Pakistani analysts who argue that Pakistan's role in propping up the Taliban is overplayed and Taliban, uh, Pakistan may have played the role of a solicitor between China and Taliban and pretty much uh, the Pakistan state and the agencies are only doing China's bidding. Do you feel there is truth to that, that the primary interest is not of Pakistan, but it is the China's Belt and Road Initiative going into South Asia, uh, Central Asia, which is what connected the Taliban to them? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, several great questions built into that question. Um, yeah, yeah, perhaps to an extent, this notion of uh, you know the Taliban being Pakistan's proxy is a bit uh, is a bit is a bit exaggerated, just in the sense that um, you know the two don't get along quite as well as many suggest. I mean, there have been a number of disagreements between the Taliban and the Pakistani uh, deep state, so to speak, and and this has been the case for quite some time. You know, I remember there was a really interesting report that uh, NATO uh, produced about almost 10 years ago in 2012, based on interviews with Taliban um, detainees in some, somewhere in Afghanistan being held by, by NATO forces. Um, and these were high level Taliban, they were low level Taliban, and they were offering comments about Pakistan that were very negative. It was very interesting. Uh, they, were, they, they basically conveyed this idea that they were unhappy for having to be dependent on Pakistan for sanctuaries and other forms of support. And then also what's very interesting is that the Taliban does not recognize the Duran line. Um, like most, that's been the, the official Afghan position um, ever since Pakistan uh, became independent. This is something that I think Islamabad is unwilling to acknowledge. So that's, that's a problem right there. Uh, but that said, no, th there's no country in the region uh, that has had more influence over the Taliban than Pakistan, just because of the long relationship, you know, Pakistan being one of the only three countries to recognize the Taliban state in the 90s, Pakistan being the last state to stop recognizing uh, the Taliban after the 9-11 attacks, the sanctuaries, uh, the, the medical support for, um, for, for, uh, for Taliban fighters, that combination of support are things that no other country can, can speak of. So the influence is there for sure. But in terms of the China factor, yes, I mean, this is becoming increasingly salient. I mean, we've seen over the last few years, the Taliban has um, sort of diversified its sources of external uh, partners, so to speak. Uh, you know, it had started to engage with Iran and there had also been a number of Taliban leaders that had started hanging out in Iran. But China also, uh, China diplomatically started engaging very heavily with the Taliban some years ago. And so when you had this high level delegation of Taliban that went to, to meet with Chinese officials in, uh, in, in China earlier this year, that was not the first time that happened. It happened several times. And I think that yes, China does want to be able to bring investment into Afghanistan, but it will only feel comfortable doing that if the security situation is better. And now I think China is in a really great position because the Taliban, at least for now, has ended its war. So you're not going to have this furious insurgency being fought. And I think that China knows the Taliban will give its backing to Chinese infrastructure projects. The Taliban, I think, would be perfectly comfortable um, endorsing any type of Chinese investments, uh, infrastructure projects in Afghanistan. The Taliban has previously said that any type of foreign-backed um, infrastructure project in Afghanistan is okay so long as it fulfills Afghan national development goals. Uh, the Taliban has actually endorsed the TAPI pipeline which is backed by the US and features India as one of the, the members. So if it's willing to endorse that, I don't see why I would have any problems with, uh, with, with Chinese investments. Final point on this, the other big security concern China has had in Afghanistan beyond the war is ETIM, this group, this terrorist group comprised mainly of Uyghur militants. And I think that 
China believes, rightfully so, that the Taliban would actually be helpful in terms of curbing that group or basically telling it that it cannot operate in Afghanistan. And that's because Eaton is not much of a, of a danger. I think China overflate, uh, inflates the threat posed by Eaton in order to justify uh, cracking down on the weaker community inside, Afghan inside China. Um, I think that um, uh, the Taliban uh, recognizes that this is not a group that poses any, that provides any benefit to the, to the Taliban. It's done most of its fighting in Syria, not in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and what's in, another thing that's interesting about the Taliban is that it hasn't, it's been very quiet about the plight of the Uyghurs. Um, so I don't think it would go out of its way to back this, this Uyghur group. In contrast to the Pakistani Taliban, which has started to bring um, grievances about the Uyghurs into its messaging, and has of course started targeting Chinese targets in Pakistan, the Taliban in Afghanistan has not done this. So my point here is that I think that China's goals of creating an environment in Afghanistan conducive for Chinese investment is something that the Taliban will be willing to help Beijing pursue. And obviously that all would work to the benefit of Pakistan, which is China's close ally. Pakistan has been talking about this whole geoeconomics, not geopolitics thing. So any opportunity to, to see its close, its close partner, China, bringing infrastructure into Afghanistan, and that would clearly be something that Pakistan would wanna to contribute to in some way, that would be music to the ears of Islamabad. So for people in Afghanistan who may be listening to this and may be concerned listening uh, to what you have to say, I have no qualms about US's imperialist agendas and they may have had a capitalist interest in Afghanistan, but at least it comes with a veneer of human rights. If a video goes viral on the internet of a woman being flogged in the street, the American government has to respond. It's the American people which, which will stand up to that, pressurize their government. China's uh, investment or China's infrastructure development does not seemingly at least even come with that veneer of human rights. So even if those videos go viral, as long as China's interests are protected, they would not care. And we've seen that in Pakistan. China's only concern when Chinese engineers are attacked. Uh, they have no concerns that, for instance, there are even stories where Gawadar is being developed for the elite, but the people in Gawadar may not even have drinking water or, or will not be even allowed to fish in the seas that they've uh, fished for years. So should the people of Afghanistan be concerned that as long as the Taliban are able to secure China's investments in Afghanistan, they will not care what the government does to the people of Afghanistan? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, China does not give a whit about uh, human rights in China, in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, it's going to be focused on its own interests and that's in line with its, with its policies on the whole. And I think that, you know, China and several other countries that will probably be among the, the first wave of nations that uh, decide to extend formal recognition to the Taliban government, they're not going to be looking for assurances on rights uh, as many countries in the West, including the U.S. would. I think that for China, Basically, the, the only assurance is what we're going to want to get from the Taliban before formally uh, normalizing relations with the Taliban government is assurances on security, which I've already discussed, and, and counterterrorism. Now, of course, the U.S. itself oftentimes doesn't care about human rights. Um, you know, it depends who it's, who it's engaging with. I mean, this is sort of, you know, IR 101, right, that uh, morality is never, um, is never the lead motivation for considering who you identify as your partners, right? The U.S. has worked with very closely with countries like Israel and Saudi Arabia and, you know, going back years to the, these hor horrible dictatorships in Latin America during the Cold War. So, but here in the context of Afghanistan, you know, it's very different because the U.S. has, has, has indicated for quite some time that it supports its interests entail a, an Afghanistan in which rights, including women's rights, are protected and safeguarded and so on. And obviously that's not going to be the case in the Taliban's Afghanistan. So, so yes, to answer your question, um, China is not going to care uh, about human rights. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, some of these other countries, Russia, Pakistan, they're not, I don't think they're going to care about uh, uh, the issue of human rights in the sense that they'd be perfectly willing to work on formal official levels with the Taliban government, even if he, these, you know, these terrible viral videos continue to come out of the Taliban beating uh, uh, female protesters and beating journalists and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, that's just, that's just the way it is. And I think that the, the hope is that if China does come in and starts building infrastructure, that there will be some benefits that come out of that for Afghans. You know, Afghanistan badly needs better infrastructure. It badly needs 
employment to support uh, you know, the construction of those projects and so on and so forth. But you know, the, as we know, the, the track record of the Belt and Road Initiative um, is such that there's no indication that you have these positive um, spillover effects, so to speak, of you know, local communities uh, uh, seeing boosts in employment, uh, seeing boosts in uh, techno technological capacity. And that's because China, with its its investments, its infrastructure investments overseas, it tends to bring its own inputs, it brings its own labor, it brings its own technology, and it doesn't give as much back, or it doesn't give as much to the local community as it should. Um, final point on this, there has been some controversy about whether China, if it were to start investing in Afghanistan, if that would be an extension of the Belt and Road Initiative, or if that would just be separate, if it would just be more broader efforts to, to invest. I think that the, the nature of how you quote unquote expand or extend BRI into Afghanistan or ex expand or extend CPEC into Afghanistan, that, that still has to be worked out. But absolutely, China badly wants to bring infrastructure into Afghanistan. I am vehemently pro-feminism. I find the treatment of women by the Taliban disgusting, but I also acknowledge the fact that uh, on, in the Afghanistan papers on WikiLeaks, it was one of the policy decisions to use feminism as a way to justify US imperialism. So we need to be conscious of the fact that when you said the US has also compromised on human rights, it absolutely has. If I may go back to your point about the Duran line, there's been a lot of celebration in Pakistan, which I may uh, sadly, unfortunately feel may be short lived because the people feel like it's a victory for Pakistan. And the specific question is, which I keep arguing, and my position is that the Taliban and TTP are ideologically the same, and the Pakistani state may be misinformed if they think the Taliban will stand with them to, will some people even claim to, re, to reclaim Kashmir, which is idiotic, but even to fight TTP. So what's your position on Taliban supporting the TTP? Do you feel that they will support the Pakistan state and curb down TTP? or they won't do that since ideologically TTP and Afghan Taliban are aligned? Yeah, I'm, I'm very skeptical that the Taliban will actually curb the TTP and tell it that it's no longer welcome in Afghanistan for a number of reasons. One is indeed the fact that they are very close. Uh, you know, they're obviously, they have different targets. Pakistan, you know, waged its campaign in pa the, the Pakistani Taliban had waged its campaign in Pakistan. The Taliban in Afghanistan is focused on Afghanistan, but, there's, there's a they're ideological brothers in arms for sure in the sense that they both support the use of violence to uh, to create uh, a uh, an emirate, um, but they also have 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 fought together. Uh, the the TTP has sent many fighters to Afghanistan to fight alongside the Taliban. There, the two have staged a number of attacks together, and if you go back in history um, as well. There's just been always been a lot of support from the TTP for what the Taliban in Afghanistan has been doing. Uh, that's been there for, for such a long time. And if you look at the very formation of the TTP, right? Um, you know, before it was formally established in 2007, it was really comprised of an umbrella group of, of Pashtun tribes that were all brought together by their shared um, opposition to the US military presence in Afghanistan. So clearly there's, there's, a, there's a clear focus here in the TTP on Afghanistan and clear support for what the Taliban has been, has been doing there in terms of fighting the, the foreign occupiers, so to speak. And the other thing is, if you look at some of the, the militants, the jihadists that became, that would later become top leaders with TTP, including Batullah Massoud, the first top, the first supreme leader of the TTP, these folks were fighting in Afghanistan with the Taliban against US forces during the early years of the war in Afghanistan. So there's so many linkages here. And I think that um, for the Taliban just to decide, okay, well, we have no reason to, uh, to do any favors for the TTP, that doesn't, that's not convincing to me. Uh, also, you know, th this gets back to the issue of leverage here. Uh, I don't think that it would be accurate to think that just because Pakistan's going to tell the Taliban that it can't it can't uh, have ties with the TTP anymore that the Taliban will listen to that. And there have been times when the Taliban does not do what, what Pakistan asks it to, uh, to do. Um, and keeping in mind some of the mistrust and enmity, not enmity, but the mistrust between the two sides. You know, the, the Pakistanis in the past have, um, have arrested uh, several mate ta senior Taliban leaders, which got the Taliban really unhappy. Um, Mullah Baradar is the biggest example. 
So there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. And at the end of the day, the Taliban does not have a reputation for cracking down on terror groups that have served as friends and partners, right? ISIS is different because it's a rival. But Al Qaeda, of course, is a, is a huge example uh, right there, um, where the Taliban has refused to go against it. And so I just think that it's going to be a very difficult negotiation on the part of, of Pakistan to get the Taliban to, uh, to deny space to, to TTP. I've seen no indication that the Taliban is going to do that. And if you look at some of the messaging from Taliban leaders over the last few weeks about the TTP, you know, there's been the, the stock boilerplate language that you know, we're not going, no group will be able to use Afghan soil for non-peaceful purposes. That's boilerplate stuff. We've heard that for so long. But there was one comment, I can't remember who it was. It was one of the Taliban spokespersons who gave an interview on one of your TV stations there in Pakistan in which he basically said that Pakistan will decide how it, how it addresses the challenges posed by the TTP. That was such a telling statement right there, I thought. Uh, it was Salim Safi's show on you, I believe, where this happened. Yes. If I may specifically ask you, uh, in terms of the Pakistan state's decision, did they support uh, the Taliban being naive, thinking that they might help us with TTP, or were they between a rock and a hard place and they had no option but to support the Taliban? Or do you feel they may be interests of the Pakistani state, or at least individuals in the Pakistani state who might, as Littlefinger calls it, see chaos as a ladder? <laughs> That's an interesting quote there. Um, no, I think that it's, it's obviously a very complex and long-standing story about the, the, uh, the Pakistani relationship with the Taliban. And I think that, um, you know, one reason, if you look at recent years, uh, motivations, justification, one reason is very practical, and that is it's essentially been a hedging policy that, you know, the, the Pakistanis, like everyone else in the region, knew that eventually U.S. forces would leave. And they knew that when that happened, the Taliban would continue to be very powerful, both politically and militarily. Many couldn't have expected that it would be in a position that it's in now. But I think Pakistan knew that the Taliban would remain very, very strong politically and militarily, and that you know, things could get even more chaotic and so on. And so it was just a necessary thing to do to maintain that uh, relationship with the Taliban to ensure continued Pakistani access and influence in Afghanistan through the Taliban. So the hedging strategy is part of it. But beyond that, clearly the India factor uh, looms large here. You know, Pakistan has always been concerned about Indian footprint in Afghanistan, and especially given that uh, you know, India had very close relations with the post-Taliban governments up to the time when the Taliban took over in recent weeks. India was probably Kabul's closest partner in South Asia for quite some time. Very concerning to Pakistan. And you know, I think Pakistan viewed the Taliban as an asset that could try to push back against India to the extent that it could. I mean, we talk about how the Taliban has fought Afghan forces, NATO forces, but the Taliban has also historically been an anti-India force that has targeted Indians in, in Afghanistan in the past. And clearly for, for Pakistan, you know, this is why it could be an asset to push back um, against that. But also, you, know, you go back to the history of just you know this this long relationship between between the two sides in the sense that uh, you know the Pakistan had been providing uh, support to these mujahideen in the 1980s that eventually morphed into the Taliban and you know they were very close to Pakistan from the start and that's a long-standing relationship that you can't just throw away uh, real quickly and I think that you know those some of those sort of pro-establishment types may also argue that, well, if we were to uh, end their relationship with the Taliban, that they would then there'd be a backlash and they turn their guns on us. And this has happened before when Pakistan has turned on militants that have been previously supported. So there's all kinds of factors um, at, at play right here. But I don't, I really, I, I agree that there are security risks for Pakistan um, emerging from this Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. And we've already alluded to why. I mean, the TTP stands to strengthen. The TTP had already been resurging in recent months with its leader who had brought together uh, splinter groups of, 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 of the TTP. TTP had started doing the types of things it had done uh, around 2007 when it was first being established in terms of you know, target killings of anti-Taliban tribal leaders and so on in the, in the tribal areas. And clearly the TTP has been, has been galvanized like so many other militants galvanized by what the Taliban in Afghanistan has done. And that clearly is a threat to, to, the, to Pakistan. And you know, if you believe the TTP's own data, 
it said that uh, in August, it carried out, I believe, about 30 attacks in Pakistan. And if that's true, that would be the largest number of attacks that's carried out in any month in Pakistan for quite some time. So yeah, I, I, so I don't necessarily agree in this idea of wanting chaos, uh, just because of you know, the fact that if, if you want chaos in Afghanistan, that's one thing. But now Pakistan is in a position where it has to worry about security threats, security risks on its own soil. And that clearly is going to be a concern. Which is the ladder which might, uh, which might some people might want, but I guess that's completely uh, conjecture. So if we may ask, and on the point of TTP, they've released 10 to 15,000 TTP fighters, which the Ashraf Ghani government, which we see as anti-Pakistan, had in prison. Fakir Mohammed, who was the deputy chief, and I think will continue being the deputy chief of TTP. They've released that. He's been a, he's been in Afghanistan pre-9-11 as well, committing terrorist acts in Pakistan. So they have a long-standing relationship. But if we may go down the India question tangent, uh, India has received a lot of criticism, even in their own for, foreign policy analysts, claiming that they did not hedge their bets. So Modi giving something to the tune of $2 billion to the Ashraf Ghani government, they did not hedge their bets and they did not see the Taliban takeover coming. Uh, the specific question I have for you is, you said Taliban has had a history of being anti-India, but if tomorrow India shows up with another $2 billion for the Taliban, it's not like their ideology will stand in the face of that much money. Yeah, that's a critical point that I think it, India faces a lot of uh, challenge in Afghanistan moving forward just because it has to deal with the Taliban. But indeed, if you're trying to identify possible uh, tools of leverage for India vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban's Afghanistan, aid is, is certainly an area to look at for sure. I mean, the Taliban has not been, uh, it's, it hasn't minced its words about its desire for financial assistance. Um, but I think that if India were to provide that, if it were to provide financial support to the Taliban government, I don't think it could do that unless it were to first formally recognize the Taliban government. And I just don't, I can't imagine the, the India willing to do that, particularly the current, the current government, you know, just because of what the Taliban stands for, its ideology, and of course, its relationship with Pakistan. I think that that would be very unlikely. But yes, I think that um, this, this really is, I think, India's only card to play, uh, so to speak, that it needs to try to figure out a way to position itself to suggest that if you, Taliban, do X, Y, and Z to help us, then we'd be in a position to provide this assistance. I really think that for the foreseeable future, India's goals in Afghanistan will be very narrowly focused. It's going to want to ensure that any Indians still in Afghanistan are able, will be safe and will be able to get safe passage to get out when they want. And I think this is why you had this meeting some days ago between the Indian ambassador in, in Doha and a senior Taliban leader who's discussed to discuss that very issue. Um, I don't think that India has many interests beyond that right now. I think that India will want to just wait and see how things go. It'll want to see how the Taliban uh, acts. And I think certainly for, for India, its biggest concern is the terrorism issue. I think India is very concerned for good reason that Lashkar-e Taiba and Jaishi Muhammad, which have had a presence in Afghanistan, that they'll be in a position to really solidify themselves there with the Taliban in, in full control. LAT and JEM are not the types of groups that I see as groups that the Taliban would want to curb. Um, and, you know, sort of, again, looking at the messaging of the Taliban in recent days, I think it's very concerning to India that you had a Taliban leader uh, some days ago say that we will raise our voices for the Muslims of Kashmir. The Taliban previously said that it's not going to, it's not going to get involved in the Kashmir dispute, it's for India and Pakistan to work out. But now you have these folks saying that we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on it. You know, LET, JEM, they were galvanized as, as much as all the other militants were in the region by the Taliban takeover. But, but that type of messaging, I think could really fire them up, so to speak. Very concerning for India, but I just don't see, even with the potential of, of aid as leverage, I don't see India having the influence or the ability to try to get the Taliban to do something about LET and JEM, or at least to curb its, its rhetoric and its messaging about Kashmir. So yeah, I, I, I think it would be a long shot to get to a point where India would be able to claim that it has leverage 
and be in a position to actually disperse some funds because I don't think it's going to recognize the Taliban government anytime soon. If anybody needed more evidence that money makes the world go around, even the most vocal proponents of Palestine or Kashmir are always silent on Uyghurs, including Pakistan. Uh, so that that's just an interesting anecdote. If I may push back on that, do you feel like under the guise of humanitarian aid, uh, Western countries will start pouring in aid and we just need a couple of videos to go viral or we just need a couple of global campaigns and then the West might uh, covertly align itself or at least for the sum of their interest with the Taliban government, but the aid might pour in under the guise of humanitarianism as opposed to foreign aid. Yeah, it's a good point. Well, you go back in the history, and uh, you know, as you may recall, uh, several American uh, energy corporations engaged with the Taliban in the Taliban era to try to build out um, investments, cooperation. I'm not sure how far that got along, but you see that there is a, a track record here of the Taliban, despite its ideological compunctions, being willing to engage with, with global capitalism, uh, so to speak, which is very interesting, uh, very ironic. Of course, the Haqqani network itself is a criminal syndicate. It's, a, you know, it's an organized crime network that is very adept in using uh, financing and manipulating uh, wait finances. For Netflix, wait for Netflix to make a narcos Afghanistan and all the money will pour in. I mean, they sold yes. <laughs> poppy to run the organization. So <laughs> capitalism, does, uh, ideology does bow down to capitalism. Right, exactly. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I don't think, I think that the... Um, the US and Western countries, other Western countries are very keen on providing humanitarian assistance, but I think that they want to try to figure out a way to do it so that it doesn't have to funnel, it doesn't have to be funneled through the Afghan, through the Taliban governments, because you know, none of these countries in the West are going to move quickly to recognize the Taliban government. But they they recognize that the sanctions that they've placed on, on Afghanistan are going to make the lives of Afghans even more miserable. Um, so I think that uh, you know, there's, this week there's an aid conference that's being sponsored by the UN to try to mobilize resources to get more supplies and funding to Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the, UN, the Treasury Department in recent days has um, issued a new license that will make it possible in terms of logistics and bureaucracy of getting um, support, finances flowing into Afghanistan to aid groups and others that are not affiliated with the Taliban government. So, but I don't, I don't think the U.S. will change its position. I, mean, I can't speak for most of the countries in the West, but I think on the whole, Western countries do take human rights seriously in the context of Afghanistan. Um, and I think that you know, the more we see with, with what's coming out of Afghanistan in terms of how this Taliban cabinet looks, in terms of you know, the videos coming out about the Taliban crackdowns and, and the violence that's being used, growing reports of reprisal attacks and so on, I think that humanitarian assistance will continue to come, but I don't really see the U.S. or other Western countries quietly sort of diverting some to the to the Taliban government. Um, now, of course, you know when you get into to, to to complex, sensitive negotiations, one never knows, right? I think that for the U.S., one of its major goals is to get the freedom of um, a guy named Mark Frerix, who is the only known U.S. hostage still in Afghanistan. The Haqqani Network is to believe to be holding him. And so that's going to be a tough negotiation. The Taliban has demanded that this uh, this huge drug kingpin that's been a, that's been in a U.S. prison for many years, who's aligned with the Taliban, that he that there be a swap in which he's released in exchange for for Frerichs. The U.S. has not indicated it's willing to do that. So then, when there's you know, if you have these negotiations, the Taliban is demanding certain things. Would they demand financial support? I don't know. That they may. I don't want to speculate too much, but one can't rule out. What I'm saying is one can't rule out the possibility that maybe the Taliban will be in a position to re receive some form of financial support from, from countries in the West. But if that happens, it would be very limited and it would not be in the public eye. I think that there's, there's a fair amount of consensus within the Western capitals that money needs to flow into Afghanistan, but you need to really figure out ways to keep it out of the hands of the government, and the Taliban government there. I'm obviously not privy to private discussions, but in terms of their public posturing, it has not seemed to me at least that the Taliban is overly concerned about economic development or the people in general. Do you feel like that's an untenable position if that is their position and they will eventually have to ensure that people aren't dying of hunger or 
you feel the Taliban can still survive on the bare minimum without really caring much for infrastructure or economic development for the masses? Well, if they don't care about economic development, they're not going to survive in power long because you know, you've got this really serious economic crisis that's just gotten worse uh, in recent weeks, and especially with these sanctions that the West has put in place. Um, and uh, you know, the Taliban has no experience in governance, so to speak. Well, it has experience in governance, but that's consisted of, you know, of, uh, of whipping people and for stealing things and so on and cutting off limbs and so forth. It doesn't have experience as a group that focuses on macroeconomic policy and economic recovery plans. So it needs to think about it. It needs to make it a priority. And I think that one of the interesting things to watch for is that once the Taliban starts filling out its cabinet, we know who all the top ministers are now, but once it starts going to sort of more mid-level positions, will it be able to bring in technocrats and economists um, who are not part of the Taliban? And you know, will that be helpful? And many of these folks, the types of skill sets that the Taliban badly needs, economists and so on, many of these folks have left the country and many of those that remain, I think, would be afraid to work for the Taliban. So that's going to be a big issue. But I, I would think that the Taliban does recognize the importance of economic development. And the fact that they've been open to infrastructure uh, development and that type of thing, that suggests that they're aware. Yeah, they probably don't want to be talking all that much about economic development because that would open up questions as to what they're going to do. And they may not want to talk about a plan that they don't have yet uh, and so on and so forth. But no, make no mistake, um, you know, there's been all of this focus on what the Taliban government is going to look like. and you know, all the, the, uh, the repression they've been using against society, but the economic crisis is the big policy priority for the Taliban. It's first big initial policy challenge. And if it's not in a position to deal with that, it's going to have a lot of trouble consolidating its power. And then you could see, you know, fracturing and, uh, uh, and armed resistance and uh, possibility of return to, um, to conflicts if it's not able to, to, to deal with the economic situation. And with the fact that Afghanistan is so heavily dependent on foreign assistance that in many cases will be unavailable because of the sanctions, that just makes things tougher for the Taliban. Uh, if I may offer an alternative, I mean, the, lead, the Taliban leaders themselves have survived on crumbs and they may continue to do so. But what about a Republican utopia? Uh, the critics of big government in the US may be happy with the notion that the Taliban simply exists to impose strict punishments and people are free to do whatever they want. And in terms, it's completely anecdotal, but there is uh, anecdotal evidence where people claim that they're not policing the streets, but if somebody's caught uh, robbing something, their hands would be cut or there would be extreme punishment or they'd be hung from the street and that ensures the security situation. So in terms of not having those big government initiatives, which are valued by Western democracies or even Pakistan, countries like Pakistan to a certain extent, is there any, any credence to the notion that they may not value those economic developments as much and they may work as a small government as a security enforcing agency whereas people are free to earn their own bread at the end of the day. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly, particularly given that the uh, the political structure of Afghanistan has always been very uh, decentralized, uh, so to speak. Um, and indeed, yeah, I mean, one of the Taliban's main pitches, so to speak, is that, you know, it could, it's brought peace to, uh, to Afghanistan and that uh, it needs to reserve the right to use swift forms of justice to ensure that security. But I think that that, that narrative risks being undercut by the reality of the groups like ISIS, Khorasan, which are, I think will try to curb the Taliban and try to make it difficult to consolidate its power by, by staging attacks. Um, so that could be a problem. And then there, there's, the Taliban has never had a monopoly on the use of violence in Afghanistan. It's not just these rival terror groups like ISIS, but also other private criminal gangs that have blown up a lot of things, have blown up electricity um, uh, infrastructure over the years. So it's it's going to be difficult for the Taliban to maintain that um, that narrative that we've brought security to Afghanistan. But indeed, that, they, that has been, that's worked for them in the past. And one of the reasons why they were able to develop influence and control in rural areas is that they were able to pitch themselves to local communities as a better alternative to you know, local police and, and state, uh, state aligned security forces that were really terrorizing people more than anything else. The Taliban was able to exploit that. So um, th that has worked, but it'll be difficult, more difficult to maintain that narrative when they're in full control. But um, 
But yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the structure of the economy in Afghanistan is such that, at least in the immediate term, you need that overseas um, support. And the idea of trying to you know, create some type of, uh, uh, some type of self-sufficient uh, arrangement where you can just depend on everything uh, in place at home, maybe that could work on micro levels, and com community levels, but in a macro sense, that's going to be very difficult to carry out. I mean, you have a very weak private sector in Afghanistan and the only growth industries in the private sector or most of the growth industries in the private sector are Ill illicit, like the drug, uh, you know, like the narcotics industry, which the Taliban claims it's going to dismantle, which seems hard to believe given how much money it's made off of that industry. But uh, um, I might my, need to call my dealer and arrange for an alternative source <laughs> in case they do that. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for the Taliban to ignore the need for uh, large-scale economic development, even though it doesn't have the capacity to oversee that type of thing. You're absolutely spot on about the private sector and most of the Afghan economy, even during the Ashraf Ghani government, ran on foreign aid, something about 65%, if I'm not mistaken. And what you said about China in terms of them bringing their own expertise, I think it's fair if the same criticism is also levied against the US in terms of the roads they built, all the contractors were uh, from the US. They did not make almost, not to my knowledge at least, they did not make any industry where things could be produced in Afghanistan for Afghanistan. Um, so, in terms of this Taliban 2.0 narrative, do you buy that at all? No, not really. Um, I would argue that it's changed in the sense that it understand, now understands the value of technology and how that can be embraced. It values the importance of public relations, um, and it also values the importance of um, legitimacy. Uh, I think that it recognizes it. it, it it's in a better position. It will be in a better position if it's not regarded as a pariah by 99.9% .9 of the world's countries. But where it hasn't changed is within its broader worldview and ideological uh, beliefs. That, that clearly has not changed at all. There's no reason to think that. There's never been a reason to think that. And you know, I think that <clears throat> the fact that it now recognizes the importance of PR, that is where, that's how we've gotten to the point where we are, where we're even posing this question of whether we now have a Taliban 2.0, because that's been one of the Taliban's main PR uh, themes over the last few years that, you know, we're not, we're a changed organization from the 1990s. We support rights for women. We support human rights so long as they occur in line with Islamic law, which is so vague and ultimately means nothing. Um, but, you know, I think it's you know, the, the announcements that we've heard from the Taliban in recent weeks in terms of essentially saying that women are not welcome to come back to work unless they work in the health and education industries, that um, you know, women can come to school, but only if they're, if they're properly attired and work in, uh, uh, in, and are segregated from men. Now, you could argue that that's a, an advance from how things were in the 90s where women couldn't really have much of a public role at all. So I mean, that may be something to an extent, but the baseline ideologies um, have not, in my view, have not have not changed at all, and I think this is something that the the countries in the West have to really acknowledge that if they're looking for those types of assurances on rights and inclusivity and diversity and pluralism from this Taliban government, if, if they're looking for those assurances before they're willing to recognize the Taliban government, they're not going to get those assurances. And anything that the Taliban suggests to the contrary is really just. Uh, you know, window dressing, uh, token gestures. I mean, we've had these much ballyhooed situations of the Taliban having these meetings with Hazar, you know, Hazara leaders, for example. Well, yeah, they're having the meetings that they're going to be filmed in Kabul and the world can see this, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to crack down on Hazaras when the cameras aren't, uh, aren't there, so to speak. So this is all part of the Taliban's PR game that it's mastered in ways that it had not back in the 90s. There are multiple reports of uh, violence against Hazaras, which is emerging. And again, people ask for evidence. It's it's reports. Uh, there is a lot of curb, curbing down of journalists. So it's hard to get video evidence, but people are reporting it. And I, I believe because nothing in the Taliban's history has shown us otherwise. Uh, in terms of what did the US get wrong? Biden, a couple of days before Kabul fell, was predicting that the Afghan army will hold. I believe you also said Kabul will not fall that quickly. Do you feel like 
the U.S. think tanks and the U.S. government was overvaluing what it was hearing from their allies in Kabul or were they undervaluing the Taliban or despite being in Afghanistan for 20 years, they simply do not understand Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, there's so many reasons. And, and I should say that, um, you know, just sort of put in a, a, a little pitch for this, given that I work at a think tank. Yeah, I think that there's sometimes there's a tendency uh, in Pakistan to believe that think tanks are a monolith in DC. I oftentimes hear this reference at all. Oh, DC think tanks think that. DC think tanks think this. It's not, it's, it's more nuanced um, for sure. I mean, you do have some think tanks that have a clear political bent. You have other think tanks like the one I'm at, the Wilson Center, which are nonpartisan because they have to be because they're congressionally chartered. And you've got all kinds of different views. Most think tanks in DC don't take institutional positions. We don't because we're nonpartisan. But then you have you know, the experts and the specialists at different think tanks that have a range of different views. And so naturally you're going to have some uh, think tankers that are very hawkish on Pakistan and then you're going to have some that are not. Uh, so, so that's this is one thing to put out there. But to your to your question, if I may, if I may just ask you one more follow up on that. I know the Wilson Center is excellent. I've been in America. I know uh, about it. But do you understand the skepticism, uh, or maybe the irony in saying a congressionally sanctioned government think tank is nonpartisan? Do you understand the skepticism that comes from a statement like that? <laughs> I do absolutely, and I should and I should clarify that too. I mean, when we were congressionally chartered. Uh, we were uh, congressionally chartered as the official memorial to Woodrow Wilson, uh, and that gave us a status as a as a museum with a tie into the Smithsonian, um, and that's very apolitical, so to speak. Um, and also, the, because we're congressionally chartered, we have to be nonpartisan, which means that we have to, on a domestic front, engage with Republicans, Democrats, but also more broadly in the work that we do as a foreign policy think tank. Um, not take any type of position institutionally. But yes, I do understand. I, I understand what may seem like irony and, and hypocrisy there, <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's, it's very different. We are very independent at the end of the day. So anybody going but, to DC highly, would highly recommend a visit to the Smithsonian. I'm sorry, what was that? Anybody who's going to DC, I would highly recommend a visit to the Smithsonian. It's the entire block is brilliant. Absolutely, yes. They're, they're, all, they're all great museums. Anyway, so you know, I, I think that um, in terms of where things went wrong, I, I go back to what I had said earlier. For I mean, the, and blame can be saddled in many places. You could start in Washington, where uh, the U.S. Um, was able to achieve its initial goals very quickly, but then after that, it was not able to articulate a clear strategy for why it was still fighting. And it's very difficult to have a successful military campaign when you have no clear strategy animating or driving that campaign. I think that's quite clear. And you know what emerged in the in more recent years is that this was a mission about counterterrorism. So when Donald Trump announced his his South Asia strategy uh, soon after he became president, he said, "We're not in Afghanistan to nation build; we're there to kill terrorists." That was basically that was Biden's view as well. That was Biden's view even when he was vice president in the Obama administration. But with Bush and Obama, I think that there was just a lot of wishy washiness about you know what was really the reason why we were there. Was it to try to strengthen institutions? Was it to uh, to build democracy, or was it more narrowly focused on just uh, you know, going after the, the terrorists? I think that the, the default goal for much of that time between, say, 2003, 2004, for a decade after that, was to do everything possible on the battlefield to weaken the, the Taliban enough that it would be in a position where it would be willing to come and enter into negotiations with the U.S. and the Afghan government to end the war. So, you know, we hear a lot, especially from Pakistan, sort of like this, this I told you so, that you know, we had been telling you for years that uh, the U.S. should have accepted that there's never going to be a military solution in Afghanistan. And U.S. officials had, had thought that was the case as well. Um, they were always looking for a, a negotiation, a, a political uh, um, solution. But the mistake that was made by U.S. officials was continuing to think wrongly that with just a bit more time, Give us a bit more time, we'll be able to weaken the Taliban on the battlefield, and then we can go into talks. So that was a big mistake there. Other mistakes, the war in Iraq was a huge mistake, uh, not just in terms of the war, that war, but in the Afghanistan context, because when the war in Iraq started, that happened at the very moment when the Taliban was reconstituting itself, when it was starting to strengthen, it was starting to build up a viable insurgency. And it was at that very moment when the Bush administration turned its attention away, reallocated resources to Iraq, 
And there were several years where the Taliban was basically given free reign to build up its strength and declare this, this insurgency uh, against the U.S. So that was a huge mistake on the part of the, uh, the administration. And there's also just you know, the, the fact that so many making policy in Afghanistan didn't understand Afghanistan, didn't know it well. And I'm sure that many of them consulted with the academic experts on the outside, but clearly it wasn't reflected in, in policy. This idea of trying to recreate Afghanistan in, in the image of the US, obviously that's not something that can work. It's not the first time the US has tried to do that. It tried to do that in Iraq to an extent. And also it, it had done that in other times in previous occupations, even going back to the US occupation of the Philippines. Uh, the very end of the 20th century, you know, you had these efforts to Americanize the Philippines in really remarkable ways. It didn't work at all. It just stoked more unhappiness. Anyway, uh, then absolutely another reason for why the U.S. got it wrong was not being able to deal with the realities of these deep structural weaknesses within the Afghan state, uh, and including the Afghan security forces. Now, the U.S. knew it knew that there were serious problems with corruption and so on. It knew this, but it was either unwilling to accept that or so convinced that it had to make things work that it just had to focus on other things. And so, you know, it focused on throwing money at, uh, at the Afghan security forces to provide weaponry and then for training and advising. But the deeper, more structural problems, those are not problems that you can throw money at, right? It's, it's not, this is very obvious. And so I think that yeah, you could argue that U.S. officials uh, over a course of many time underestimated the seriousness of those structural deficiencies that made it very difficult for the Afghan state to withstand the Taliban offensives, which the Taliban was able to exploit in a big way. Um, so, so I think those are other areas where, where things went wrong. And I know that there's a lot of, a lot of debate about the role of Pakistan in all of this. Uh, you know, there are many analysts, including in D.C., that think that um, you know, if Pakistan wasn't supporting the Taliban, then I think that the Taliban would just be a nuisance, not a not what it's become. Well, yes, I, I can acknowledge that argument to an extent, in the sense that you, know, you look at all the academic literature out there over the last few decades, and there's so many examples of insurgencies that enjoyed cross-border sanctuaries. In most cases, they didn't lose. They may not have won their battles, but they didn't lose. So I think that's something to to consider for sure. But I think we need to look. At, at the Afghan state, at the fact that you just had leaders there that were unable to, to deliver basic services and win over their populations. And that was something the Taliban was able to take advantage of and ramp up recruitment. The US was simply not able to do anything about that. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's just the, the fact that the US never had a clear game plan. It never had a clear game plan after its initial goals were achieved at the end of 2001. I think the pushback that you might get from some Pakistani think tanks, and we have no such thing as nonpartisan think tanks. If our think tanks are working with the government, they will necessarily be partisan. So if the popular view that is being espoused from uh, some DC think tanks is blaming Pakistan, then it's in the government and the state's interest to engage certain think tanks. And I have no qualms about this saying they're directly engaged, they're directly asked to present the Pakistan position. So for them to push back against that narrative, I see that game, that game of state interest being played as well. Uh, I think that was a great summary of everything that the US did wrong in the past 20 years. But in the past few months, did things go wrong or did things go exactly as they were supposed to? Once the US government sold the Afghan government down the river in Doha, Nothing else. This was inevitable. There was no other thing that could have possibly happened apart from this. Yeah, no, this is true. Um, I, I think that you you certainly have to fault the previous the, the Ghani government uh, for sure. But you know, we've now seen there's been a lot of reportage in recent weeks that indicates that Ghani was actually given an opportunity to uh, reach an understanding with the Taliban for some type of transitional government that would have prevented the Taliban would from never have accepted in. that, would they? Well, there's no way of knowing. Uh, and honestly, I have no clue. But, you know, I think that the one could argue that from the start, the Doha Accord was very flawed because it, it, it demanded so much of an Afghan government that was not involved in those negotiations while demanding very little of the Taliban. And in return, the U.S. was in a position where it had to squander its main tool of leverage, its true posture. Um, you know, indeed, the only thing the Taliban had to do was stop fire assist that was stop shooting at Afghan at, at U.S. troops to allow them to uh, to get out of the country. 
and it was always going to be very difficult to have a sense as to whether the Taliban was really denying space to Al Qaeda to plan and, and mount attacks on the U.S. and its allies. That was the only other um, thing that the Taliban was asked to do in that agreement. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess you could argue that it was inevitable that after the Doha Accord that the Taliban would find its way back to power. But I don't think it was inevitable that, it would, that the Taliban would, would actually come into power and, and take over the country while US troops were still on the ground. That's where I think there could have been avoidance. And that's where I think that the, the, the inability of the Afghan government for whatever reason to anticipate what was happening. I mean, that's, that's, that's a big concern. I mean, we've known, you know, there, for, for many months, it had been documented and very clear that Afghan security forces were in a really, really bad state, not just in terms of being overwhelmed on the battlefield by the Taliban, but also, you know, they were, they were running out of food and water, they didn't have weapons, they didn't have anything, and they weren't getting support from the, from the government, from the civilian leadership. That, to me, is where you could really place a lot of the failure in this Afghan state. And so you, in some ways, you can't blame the Afghan security forces for just giving up and abandoning their, their posts and ceding space to the Taliban. And obviously when, when Biden announced his decision to withdraw, that's sort of like the straw that, that uh, broke the camel's back. So there I think that um, maybe there is a, an inability to recognize on the part of so many of us that that total lack of support from the government for the Afghan forces and also the, the fact that many Afghan, many members of the Afghan military may not have seen the Ghani government as a legitimate one I think that there's perhaps a failure to, under, to to acknowledge how serious those problems were and how much that could be, how much that could benefit to the Taliban and so quickly. Which is why I felt it was almost offensive for Biden to say that we can't give Afghans a way to fight. That was never the argument. It might be the naivety or it might be the fact that they knew about it but could not publicly say it, that 300,000 figure a lot of it was ghost battalions. It simply did not exist. Uh, some of the generals were taking money and salary for those ghost battalions and the soldiers never existed. Some of the were logistical problems where outposts could only be fed or given food and water through air support. And once air support was pulled, they could not have. I know, Michael, you have to run. So I just have a couple of questions. In 2016, you said that it's really hard for India to isolate Pakistan on the international stage due to our ties with China and Saudi Arabia. Do you still maintain that? Or do you feel like in the social media age, India has done a decent job at, uh, in terms of at least influencing whether it's keeping Pakistan on the FATF list? Not to say that's just India's doing, but uh, it, it absolutely is uh, a sword that's hanging over Pakistan's head, that FATF gray list. And there is some isolation in terms of painting Pakistan in a certain way on the international stage. Do you feel they're in a stronger position to do that? Or do you still feel due to our ties with Saudi Arabia and China that it's impossible for India to isolate us on the international stage? Yeah, I still hold true to that. And in fact, I would argue that recent events have, uh, have strengthened that uh, argument. Uh, you know, not as much just looking at China and Saudi Arabia, and especially because Pakistan's relationship with Saudi Arabia has taken a bit of a, of a, of a, of a tumble in, you know, over the last year or so. But I think that Afghanistan has actually strengthened Pakistan's regional diplomatic footprint, right? I mean, that uh, you're starting to see a lot of activity, or you've seen over the last few years, a lot of activity, multilateral regional activity involving uh, Pakistan on on Afghanistan, uh, you look at Pakistan's participation in the Troika Plus uh, activities, and you look at its participation in a number of other regional uh, in diplomatic initiatives on Afghanistan, and you look at what's happened in recent days where you've got a series of meetings taking place, not under the rubric of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or other you know, regularly scheduled meetings of regional organizations, but you know, you've got, you had all of the, the, the immediate neighbors of, uh, of Afghanistan meeting and issuing a statement. Uh, you know, Pakistan has apparently hosted a meeting or will host a meeting involving intelligence chiefs from a number of countries. Um, so, you know, I, I think that Pakistan is taking advantage of its significance in the Afghanistan story, not just as a bordering country of Afghanistan, but uh, you know, as a country that has that very unique relationship with Afghanistan and that it has a close relationship with, with the Taliban government and very few countries can, can say that. Um, 
And, you know, sort of moving, moving further afield a bit, uh, some time ago, not too long ago, several months ago, I believe Pakistan hosted this huge naval exercise. Um, I think it was called the Amman exercise, in which you had navies from, I think, about 40 countries that came to do these exercises in the Arabian Sea. Pakistan hosted it all. So I think that shows that Pakistan actually has a degree of convening power um, as well. And then when you look at India and, and its own activities, India has struggled. Uh, it's had some, some, some tensions with its neighbors. And I'm not just talking about Pakistan. It's had some, some tensions with Bangladesh. It's had some tensions with Nepal. And of course, the, the, the issues with China have gotten worse. A lot of that's related to India's domestic policies, including uh, the, the new, uh, this new citizenship law that has made a lot of people unhappy in Bangladesh. So my point is that absolutely India still remains the key regional player. It's, it's obviously it's the biggest, most powerful, um, most influential player in South Asia. But I do think Pakistan has been able to hold its own uh, in the sense that it's been able to use Afghanistan as a launch pad for regional diplomatic activities in which it can take in which it can take a lead role. And that's going to continue, especially now that the Taliban is in control. Many countries will be looking to Pakistan as a, as a key interlocutor, a key player. Obviously, some countries will see Pakistan as a big part of the problem. But I think in the region, Pakistan is making a lot more friends. It's Russia, its relationship with Russia is growing. It's, it's been deepening or trying to deepen relations with many countries in Central Asia. Its relations with Turkey continue to grow. Uh, with China, of course, they're in a great place. So, yeah, I, I think that what I said in 2016 is even more true now than it was then. You were skeptical of the notion of a U.S.-China Cold War, but even if we say it as a global competition between China and uh, U.S., somebody wanted to ask, does India stand to benefit from that global competition between China and the U.S., considering its geopolitical position? Yeah, oh, certainly. And I think this is where, you know, I've talked about how India is, is in a tough spot strategically, given what happened in Afghanistan, but certainly the growing, uh, you know, the deepening U.S.-China rivalry is something that uh, is, is clearly, it, it works to India's advantage, not just because it would benefit from a worsening rivalry between the world's two most powerful players, but because it suggests that the relationship between the U.S. and India will get stronger, which is something that India is clearly looking for. India's own relations with China have, um, have, have suffered in, re in recent months on levels that they haven't since the 1970s. And I think that India will be hoping to uh, strengthen its defense relations with the U.S. even more to enable India to strengthen its capacities to project power vis-a-vis -vis India, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Uh, you know, this does cause sort of, it does sort of um, uh, amplify a longstanding um, awkward issue in the U.S.-India relationship, and that is that as the U.S.-India relationship grows and as both countries continue to view China as their main, the main driver of their growing partnership, um, I think that the U.S. may want India to go in directions that India is not willing to go to deal with this, this combined threat. You know, for India, the idea, I think, is to build up defense relations with the U.S. so that there could be more arms sales and intelligence sharing and so on. But the U.S. is looking for India to be in a position to act like traditional alliance partners of the U.S., where it would be willing to look to the possibility of hypothetically being involved in kinetic activities to target China and strengthen its... Uh, its military capacity, so they would be in, in more of a position to, to back up uh, what the US has going for it. Um, I'm not saying that the US is looking to fight a war against China or that it would want India to join it, but I think that you know, the, the US is looking for more of a, a more traditional defense alliance with India. And of course, India though, uh, doesn't do alliance politics. And you would think if there's ever a time that it would want to um, sign on to an alliance with the U.S., it would be after the, uh, the Ladakh crisis, of course. But you know, just a few days after the Ladakh, that horrible um, clash happened uh, a year ago, July, the Indian foreign minister came out and said that we, we don't do alliances and we never will. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. But yeah, the U.S.-China rivalry does offer opportunities for, for the U.S.-India relationship to get even stronger. Uh so my last question to you is in the same uh, panel discussion in 2016, you also said Pakistan is a great emerging market. In 2016, we had seemingly defeated TTP. We had gotten over our internal terrorism issues and we were looking economically towards the world as well as an emerging market. Five years down the line, uh, you've mentioned we might be geopolitically in a better situation. You feel economically we're better situated now with CPEC a lot more crystallized or do you feel 
we might suffer with uh, a rise in that TTP ideology, if not the organization itself. Do you feel we have a lot more risks now than we did in 2016? Or are we still in a great place as an emerging market for the world? Well, you know, the, the economy in Pakistan had, had been suffering for some, for some time. And I do think it's worth acknowledging that it has stabilized to an extent on macroeconomic levels. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's too early to judge whether CPEC had an impact. I think that CPEC, if anything, distorts the economy in Pakistan. I'm not necessarily sure if we could see that strengthening the economy on the whole. Certainly the fact that you've got more electricity uh, generation now, more, more power uh, electricity generation on the grid coming out of CPEC projects. That's important for sure. But you know what CPEC has done is saddled Pakistan with a lot of loans that eventually will have to be paid back. And pa Pakistan continues to have a balance of payments uh, problem. And so that's these loans are not going to be uh, easy to pay off down the road. Um, but um, I think that certainly the, the, broadly speaking, the security situation had been continuing to improve, but I do think that you have to look at, well, several things here. One is this, what this surge of attacks um, from a, a resurgent TTP. That is certainly something to worry about because of the impact that could have economically on investor perceptions and so on. And you know, make no mistake, we're nowhere near where we were for that horrible, horrible period between 2007 and 2014. But you know, we're seeing a, a, a resurgent TTP, which will become even more resurgent given the Taliban victory in Afghanistan. You're looking at the TTP diversifying its sources of targets. It appears to be going after Chinese targets now. You've also had this upsurge in activities by Baluch separatists. And you know, there have been reports that these Baluch separatists are trying to form new partnerships with other uh, ethnic separatist groups, including Sindhi ones. So this is all very worrisome for security, but by extension for, for the economy. Um, beyond that, though, I think that you, you had alluded to it before, FATF, that's a huge issue. I think that so long as Pakistan is still on that gray list, you know, there's going to be that like some level of, um, of, of hesitation from, from investors. It's nowhere near being blacklisted, which will not happen to, to Pakistan. But I think that so long as Pakistan stays on the FATF, that could, that could complicate things uh, for sure. But I think that it is a bit of a pipe dream to think that Pakistan will be able to magically transition from this geopolitics idea to geoeconomics. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could talk about how Pakistan is having all these great meetings with Central Asian states and has come out with uh, uh, you know, a new agreement recently to be part of this new trans, uh, transnational railroad project in Afghanistan in partnership with Uzbekistan. You could talk about things like that, but there are a lot of structural uh, a lot of structural challenges within the Pakistani economy that make it, to me, hard to believe to think that Pakistan will suddenly become this node for, for, for connectivity. There's a lot of things that have to be worked out uh, before, that can, uh, before that can be the case. And you know, at the end of the day, you still have these underlying weaknesses in the Pakistan economy in the sense that you don't have a, divor a diversified source of value-added exports, right? There's still this heavy dependence on textiles and apparel, which, you know, have had some success, but, you know, it's very hard for them to compete with the likes of Chinese and Bangladeshi and Vietnamese um, products as well. So the, the, the structural constraints remain in place. And I think that um, it's going to continue to pose a problem uh, for Pakistan. And with the indications that the security situation is starting to become a bit hotter again, that clearly will have deleterious implications for economic uh, development too. Hoping for the best, if nothing, I want the government to sponsor podcasts. So maybe technologically we can export these and I can get some money as well. Uh, thank you so much. If we, I may end on a lighter note. Uh, I knew you were the right person to talk about this when I put up a picture and some people said you're an ISI agent and some people said you're Modi's puppet. So if you get both those criticisms, that means you're probably doing something right. But there was a very interesting question <clears throat> that which trolls do you find worse? Uh, in India, they're known, the pro-government trolls far right are known as buffs, and in Pakistan is a pejorative word used, UTIs, which is for PTI supporters of a certain ilk. Who are worse, Indian far right trolls or Pakistani far right trolls? <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I would say that there's uh, unfortunately a lot of equivalence between the two, uh, and I would argue that they're pretty much identical. Uh, now, of course, people hear that and they'll think that I'm trying to balance the two sides, which will cause more I'm criticism. Partisan. But yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, they're, they're, I feel that they're 
equal in terms of, of volume, uh, in terms of quantity, uh, in terms of level of stupidity. Uh, on both sides, there's, there, it's, it's completely the same. You can't distinguish them, uh, quite frankly. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And you know, I got to say that uh, if I really were both an ISI and a raw agent, you'd think I'd be making a lot more money than I am. And I could have a much nicer house with the garage and a few nice cars, but uh, I'm not there yet. So I think we need to get the Israelis uh, to sponsor me too, to allow me to make some more money. <laughs> why, why did I get so many questions about Christine Fair? What is, what, do you guys have a fight? What is happening on that front? To be honest, I've completely stayed out of it. Um, I don't really like to comment on it. Uh, I never engage with anyone that uh, uses the type of abuse that I hear uh, from that individual. So would really not comment on it. But uh, all I have to say is I've never done anything um, so far as I know, other than apparently not be as smart as she is, which I've never claimed that I am smarter than her. But um, what can you do? I think the best thing to do is just to disengage and ignore, right? I went looking to see what the issue was and she calls you Google Bacha, which I she thinks is really smart because it's Google man and she's like, it's a child. My only thing is if you're calling somebody a child, don't do something this juvenile where you're like, oh, the name is man in Urdu. I can make it Bacha. I mean, that's as dumb as you calling her Krishin Gori or Krishin Kali. And it's also this overvaluing identity politics where she's like, uh, it's a white man's opinion. And I'm like, woman, you are in that equally white savior complex criticism. So don't get out of that by invoking uh, the woman identity. But well, discussion for another time. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, do you want to leave anybody with inspiring words to close this off? <laughs> no, all, all I'll say that this is what, this was a, a really great discussion. It was it was great to engage with you. Um, I had been aware of some of your previous podcasts, and uh, I've enjoyed them. Um, and no, uh, it was uh, it was great to do this with you. And we'll have to uh, to do it again. Perhaps the next time we'll wear different colored shirts so that we don't look like twins. Thanks. It might be interesting getting somebody from Pakistan and somebody from Afghanistan and having you and having that discussion. Uh, thank you so much. I didn't know that you were hearing this podcast. Do you understand Urdu now that you've been an expert on South Asia for that long? Do you make out most of Hindi or Urdu or do you get by? Yeah, I wouldn't want to embarrass myself by trying to uh, to speak it right now. But yeah, I mean, after all these years, I can certainly pick things up. Though, I'd, honestly, in an ideal world, I would take some time off from my schedule and do one of these intensive uh, language courses to really become um, a speaker. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, I'm not going to embarrass myself. So I would, uh, I would oh, say that yeah, I can make out here some of your, some of what you guys are talking about in your podcast, but uh, not, not, not everything by any means. And I, of course, I hear a lot secondhand too. Now, of course, one wonders if what one hears secondhand about the podcast is actually a true reflection of what was said. But <laughs> let's do let's get something in Urdu. Not an upki bar, Modi Sarkar, but till Duolingo stalks you to death. Uh let's get a <laughs> sentence in Urdu to close this off. <laughs> uh, sorry, what was that? Can we get a sentence in Urdu to close this off? No, no, no. I'm not going to embarrass myself. But <laughs> unless you wanted me to sing uh, Dil Dil Pakistan uh, before. Uh, <laughs> Anybody who's calling you an agent, that, that will be used forever as evidence if you ever do that. So we're not going to make you do that. Yeah, which is unfortunate. But um, at any rate, what can one do? I think it's a pretty good song. It's pretty catchy. Yeah. Um, it's, maybe it's a bit dated, but it, it's, it's infectious. So I like it. I like it. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Michael. And thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Like, share, subscribe, comment. And if you like this podcast, you might like some other podcasts on this channel. And if you are interested in Afghanistan, we also recently did a podcast with Hush Mosley, who was a former senior producer at Al Jazeera, is an independent analyst on Afghanistan and was also an advisor to the former Afghan president.